We're going to begin today by looking at the nervous <laughs> tissue. Uh, we remember that tissue is made up of cells, and so the nervous tissue is going to be made up of a variety of different cell types. So we have these two broad categories of neurons and neuroglia. So our neurons are the cells that are responsible for actually getting the signal sent uh, either to the CNS or away from the CNS and processing the information in the CNS itself. Neuroglia are there to kind of make sure everything goes smoothly. So do you remember what the glia part meant from the reading? It's a Greek reference. Dangly. <laughs> it's a really good guess. It was supposed to, it means glue. And so scientists thought that it was just sort of a glue that held all the neurons in place and didn't really do anything. But in reality, we're finding that they have very important functions. They help sustain the nervous system. And there's probably much more that we still don't know about them. And we think about all the neurological disorders that are out there, maybe it's the neuroglia that we should be focusing on and not so much on the neurons. It's kind of this thing where is it the environment that it's in that's causing this deterioration or is it something with the neuron itself and we're just not quite there yet. So you are responsible for knowing the basic structure of a neuron. You have the receiving end, you have the processing end, and then you have the transmission end where the signal is going to be sent out. In your lab manual, there is a diagram with this. I would personally like cover up the different labels and make sure that I can remember the different terms and that kind of thing. Not only do you want to know the anatomy, you want to know how each part of it is functioning. So the physiology. The physiology. So I'm showing you just the typical structure of a neuron. Uh, this is uh, an experiment that took place in 2005 where they subjected some rats to a stressful environment. So think about how could you stress out a rat? Punch it. <laughs> that would be one way, I'm sure, to stress it out. But they Strangle built it. these cages. Say, say it again. They built these special cages for the rats that had a shock floor. And so periodically, the floor would sap them. And that caused a lot of problems for the rats. They were very stressed out Is all the time. It happened at random frequency, so they didn't know when they were going to get zapped. It wasn't like, okay, I know if I go over to the water, I'm going to get zapped. No, it was just like randomly. <laughs> so it was stressful. You can imagine if you were sitting in class animal, and all of a sudden I just zapped all of you. So what we're looking at is the results of the experiment. They were able to photograph the brain tissue of these rats. And so this is the tissue of a normal rat with normal development. And this is the one that has been zapped. So just make some observations. What do you see? What's different? Uh, it's not like as extended. Describe to me what you mean by that. What's not as extended? Uh, and which one are you referring to? The one on the right is not extended as much. Okay. So uh, Chase, you're correct when you say not as extended, but I'm thinking that the word extended doesn't quite give the description not that I'm looking developed. for here. Developed, I like. And when I look at this, it looks to me almost like a tree with all the different branches. And so what I'm seeing is that we have less branching. On the right, you have less branching, which means you have less connections happening. And so when you, as a human being, the implication then that humans who go through life stressed out have less branching in their nervous system, less connections in the brain. And so when we think about child development and children who have had difficult uh, experiences, then when they come into school and they're put under this pressure and they don't have the same amount of neural development as other kids who have great lives, we can see how we start to end up with these discrepancies in academic abilities. So knowing that, we want to find ways to remediate that and be able to reverse this situation. So that's just some of the areas of research in neuroscience these days. So thank your parents that they took care of you when you were little and so you have lots of branching. So they're trying to generate new nervous systems still? Right, so we can't really regrow neurons. Yeah. Neurons are the kinds of cells that don't go through mitosis, they don't um, divide. But connections between neurons can form and they can also be pruned. And so if you're not using your brain, you lose it. You know when they say if you don't use it, you lose it? Yeah. If you stop using certain uh, processes, then that will be pruned and your brain will dedicate itself to the things that you are doing and 
increase the branches there, especially in childhood development. That's where these connections really get laid down in the first five years of development. So that's why it's so important when you have kids, you know, you read to them, you stimulate them, you sing, you play with them, you make the different faces that kids love, peekaboo, that kind of thing. It helps to cause all the branching to take place. This is a summary of the regions of the neuron that are testable for you. You need to know that the cell body is where you have all the normal cell parts in a neuron, the nucleus, mitochondria, regular organelles. So this is where you have DNA. Um, you're going to have energy production, metabolism, met metabolic processes taking there. Dendrites send information into the cell body. So they're receiving the signals and transmitting it to the cell body. The cell body processes it and then sends it on to the axon. So that's gonna conduct your impulse away from the cell body. We saw a little bit of the axon terminal when we were looking at the neuromuscular junction because that's where that neuron would connect to the target cell. And the terminal is where you're gonna find the release of different neurotransmitters to stimulate the next action. Whether it's to stimulate another neuron or to stimulate a muscle, to stimulate a gland, to produce some sort of response in your body. Neurons don't have direct connections, not a gap junction like you would find in your heart where everything needs to be completely connected so you get synchronized uh, contraction of the heart muscle. Instead, you have a bit of a gap. So we call this paracrine signaling where you have uh, one cell signaling to a nearby cell without a direct connection. So because you have this gap, that means that the chemicals that get released have to diffuse across the gap to reach the target. So you're dependent on these concentration gradients in the gap itself. So that region, the synaptic cleft, is where you'll find mechanisms um, to facilitate the diffusion or perhaps to eliminate the chemicals. So you'll have these enzymes that break down whatever the neurotransmitter is. Like we saw in our neuromuscular junction, we had that... Yeah. So the region that's just past the cell body and just before the axon itself is called that trigger zone. And so you have to have actual activation of the rest of the neuron to make that signal go because you're receiving stimuli all the time. It doesn't mean you need to react to it. So when I look around the room, I see a lot of things, but I may or may not decide I need to do something about that. So as your brain takes in all these signals, it's going to use chemical gradients and chemical uh, messengers to determine are we going to react to this? So you receive the stimuli, you process the stimuli, but whether or not you respond accordingly is kind of up for grabs here. And so, for example, I look around, uh, I might see that one of you has dropped something on the floor, but I decide not to do anything about it. And so I'm not going to send the signal to my muscles to, you know, come over and say, hey, Andrew, can you pick that up? So I just let it go. So we get to the trigger zone, but we don't actually fire the gun. You don't actually send the signal through the neuron. Yes. So the trigger zone is just this region. So let me go back to the words now. So it's the initial segment of the axon. So the very first part, that's our going to be like our go point. Are we going to send the signal on or not? So it's before you get to the first bit of myelin, which is your Schwann cell, Schwann cell. Schwann cells actually make up the myelin on the axon itself. And the axon hillock is the very first bit of the axon that actually does the transmission of the signal. So it's right in between. Are we going to go or not? And so if the trigger zone is activated, the rest of the signal will get sent. Then we're going to look at neuroglia a little bit. And when you were in the textbook, you had this chart, but I felt like the organization of the chart was not really conducive to retaining it and memorizing it. And so I want to show it to you a different way. So in the central nervous system, you have four types of cells, and I think they all have pretty complicated names. And so if I remember that the central nervous system has this complexity, then I see all these complex cell names are there with the central nervous system. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, you just have the two S ones, Schwann and satellite. So if you can keep that straight, that'll help you get a multiple choice question on the next test, because I'll ask you something like, which of these is not found in the peripheral nervous system? So you know the two S cells are in the peripheral nervous system, Schwann and satellite cells just a different representation. You do also want to know what these cells are responsible for. Okay. So astrocytes are the most abundant uh, neuroglial cell that's in your nervous system. And so the question is why? What the heck are they doing? 
It seems like they're helping to maintain concentration gradients and they're helping to supply your neurons with the nutrients that they need. And so they're a pretty big deal. So when we look at neurological disorders where something like this is a problem, perhaps it's the astrocytes that are implicated. So if we can have a better understanding of their function, we can possibly prevent some of these diseases. So you're saying like it's supporting the Supporting it, but you want to say specifically like how. So it's the environment. It's making sure that it has enough food. It's making sure that wastes are getting removed. It's making sure that the ion gradients, the concentration gradients that are in the environment stay where they're supposed to be. Then you have these immune cells. They act like white blood cells, but they live in the nervous system. So typically, your nervous system is protected. It should not get an infection because it has a special barrier. Do you remember the name of the barrier? Uh, the blood brain barrier, the BBB, right? So the blood brain barrier <laughs> oh, the BBB. isolates your nervous system from the rest of the world. And so you have to have VIP access to get into the nervous system. So typically infection should not be an issue, but as first year college students next year, you know you have to get a vaccination. Meningitis. Meningitis. That's a bacterial infection that affects the nervous system, but bacteria shouldn't be able to get in. So this blood-brain barrier is generally very effective, but meningitis has a special sneaky mechanism by which it bypasses the blood-brain barrier. We'll talk more about that when we look at it. I'm sorry. When my son was born, he had a high fever, and so they rushed him to the emergency room, and they did a spinal tap. So a spinal tap is when they insert a needle into your spinal uh, column, and they drain fluid. So they're looking to see if the fluid is clear or cloudy. Your fluid should be completely clear. By the way, the fluid is produced by the ependymal cells. Uh, that's the CSF, your cerebrospinal fluid. It should be totally clear. It should look just like water. And that's because it's filtering your blood. So it's basically taking the plasma, which is all the good nutrients that would be in your bloodstream, giving it to the brain, and then getting rid of waste. And so you just have this beautiful, clear, perfectly clear fluid in your nervous system, unless there's an infection. So if somehow bacteria made it in, it would be the job of the microglial cells to attack like blood, white blood cells engulf those bacterial particles or foreign particles, break them down with enzymes to destroy it. Meningitis is really sneaky. It gets past these defenses. Then we have the oligodendrocytes, which as a cell actually serves to insulate the neuron. It wraps around the neuron itself, kind of like when you look at these cords that I have running everywhere. If it wasn't wrapped in that plastic coating, you just have like copper wires and that super sketchy. So we as finite human beings recognize that it's a good idea to have our signals insulated, to insulate these cords and your body does it as well. So we insulate the signal um, transmitting device, the axon, with this fatty material in it. So the oligodendrocytes themselves wrap around the axon. So they serve as the insulation. Uh, for your cells. But in the peripheral nervous system, we have different cell types. And so our satellite cells are helping to protect and support in the peripheral nervous system. So they are sharing this function of the astrocytes. And then the Schwann cells are serving as the insulators. And let me show you a close up of what the Schwann cells look like. So here's our neuron, we're looking at the axon. And if you zoom in, the cell itself is coiling around the axon. So it actually has these processes that wrap around. It's made of a fatty material, which really shouldn't be a surprise because cells are always enclosed in a fatty material. The cell membrane is made up of phospholipids. So you have this lipid-rich substance that helps to insulate your neuron. And another term on this slide that you're responsible for knowing is the nodes of Ranvier. So as you look at a neuron, you have these gaps in between each bundle of the myelin. The gaps are actually where the signal gets sent in sort of a leapfrog mechanism. So if we start up here at the trigger zone, we decide it's go time, we're gonna go ahead and send this signal, it then leapfrogs between these uh, bundles of myelin and it bounces off of the nodes of Ranvier. So that's gonna to help to speed transmission of a signal. It allows you to have these super fast reflexes, super fast processing time that we expect of the nervous system. We're talking nanoseconds, milliseconds. 
So my question is, what happens if myelin is destroyed? If you have no myelin, if you don't have the insulation, what effects would you expect to see on your nervous system? So I want you to do a think, pair, share. Think about it first, have an answer in your head. Don't just tell me you're gonna die. I wanna know some details behind this, because we know if anything goes wrong with anatomy and physiology, there's potential for you to die. So that's not the answer we're looking for. What specifically will happen? What will be the progression of events that you would expect to see if myelin is lost, becomes deteriorated and destroyed? So talk to your neighbor about it after you've thought it through yourself. 